Hello, welcome to a breaking all down breaking it all down vlog. I'm Count Zero. It's been a while since I last recorded. School stuff has gotten in the way. I apologize for that. Some stuff's however that I have gotten a chance to see, or rather, I've gotten a chance to see some stuff. Let's put those words in the right order. And I've managed to read enough of one of the Hugo Award nominees to pass judgment. More or less. So, let's talk about the movies first. I saw Iron Man 3 and Star Trek Into Darkness, two films which likely will be Hugo Award nominees for Best Picture next year. Because this is a triple threat, if you will, of reviewer review them, I can get this briefly without feeling like I have to go into spoilers to fill time. Um, Iron Man 3... It's a decent sequel to The Avengers. It doesn't connect quite as well with Iron Man 1 and 2 in a weird way. I liked it. There are some great action set pieces, and the characters of James Rhodes and Pepper Potts get a lot more time here than they did in the other films. Um, they got a lot more time and opportunity to shine. The narrative was fairly well structured. Um... And the, in particular, the way the character of the Mandarin was done was fantastic. Ben Kingsley did an excellent job in this role, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate his work, and you definitely should see this. Star Trek Into Darkness, an excellent sequel to the J.J. Abrams reboot. Um, in case you didn't get tell the poster on my door, I'm a fan of the reboot. Um, and of Star Trek in general. I enjoyed the movie... Benedict Cumberpatch, in this film in particular, does a really good job of demonstrating how Martin Freeman keeps him from stealing every scene he's in in Sherlock, because whenever he's on screen, he owns it. Everyone in this movie does really good acting jobs. Carl Urban, um, Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, everybody is excellent in this. But Benedict Cumberpatch comes on screen, opens his mouth, and... Everything belongs to him. He is fantastic in this role. Um, can I get the minor spoiler here? Benedict Cumberpatch plays Khan in this. This is also kind of gets into some spoiler territory for Iron Man 3, but I feel a little better about spoiling the Iron Man 3 stuff um, because it's been out for longer. Um, now... N.K. Jemsen, who wrote, who writes the Inheritance Trilogy, I reviewed the first book on this web series, um, and discussed the movie on her blog, and talked about how she, about the whole whitewashing thing with Khan, and how they felt, and how J.J. Abrams basically expressed that he's kind of in an awkward situation where, on the one hand, he's playing the character of Khan, is a character of Indian descent. And if they cast him with an Indian actor, or a Sikh actor in particular, it would load the film with some with a whole bunch of unfortunate implications that he doesn't want to get into. He doesn't want to make the character of Khan turn into some sort of racist stereotype. And on the other hand, and on the other hand, there's the argument that the character is whitewashed. Um, because he's being played by Benedict Cumberpatch, who's a white guy, as opposed to either a, a Sikh, as the character's really written as being, or as, uh, or with a Hispanic actor, much as Ricardo Montalban was in the original series and with Star Trek II. And Ms. Jimson, I want to get, like, going first name stuff, but I actually don't know her first name, um, is, basically takes the stance that they should have taken, they should have taken the, the Iron Man 3 route and handled things the way Iron Man 3 did. And I respectfully disagree with her on this. Um, and the reason I say that is in Iron Man 3, in every... Iron Man film, the villain or antagonist in some way has been a dark mirror of Tony Stark. Um, 
Ironmonger is Tony Stark comes back from his experience with this, builds the power armor, keeps selling guns, basically. Um, Whiplash slash Crimson Dynamo in Iron Man 2 is basically what happens when someone who's been slighted and cast out by the system, who has been socially destroyed and, and his father has been destroyed, comes, reve comes seeks revenge at Tony Stark using his own technology, which to a certain degree is also his, the antagonist's father's technology. It's it's the revenge tale in a different aspect. Um, it's what if Tony started with the cave and the box of scraps and never had the garage to come back to once he escaped from Afghanistan. He was always kind of at that level. And so that's kind of Crimson Dino side of things. And then with the Mandarin, in particular Ben Kingsley's character, is... He's, in his own way, the dark mirror of Tony the party animal, and also to a certain extent reflective of pre-getting-cleaned-up Robert Downey Jr. It's not just a commentary on Tony Stark the character, but also Robert Downey Jr. the actor, and what came before. Um, in terms of what he's really, in terms of the Robert Downey Jr., while a barely functioning, if not functioning, to not functioning at all alcoholic, and drug abuser, and everything else he was doing, um, was still able to put out amazing acting performances. And in the case of who the Mandarin actually is, um, he's a barely functioning alcoholic actor, um, addict, who basically got turned into the ultimate other by a evil organization out to make a boatload of money by perpetuating a war on terror. And that works for the Mandarin. It doesn't work for Khan. Part of this is due to continuity stuff in the sense that the dividing point between the main Star Trek universe and the reboot universe is basically where the Narada pops out. And it's not like the uh, and changing Khan too much, making him not an actual evil mastermind, would hurt the character, kind of. Not hurt, not hurt the character, but would be too much of a deviation that would be hard to explain. Because a lot of the other stuff, like, stuff from Enterprise still kind of shows up. Um, this is still a universe where Section 31 exists. This is still a universe... This is still a universe where Captain Jonathan Archer went through all his voyages and became an admiral, and had a dog named Porthos. All, the, all that sort of thing. Um, presumably, um, presumably the, the other re real major difference here is we now know what the Romulans look like sooner, because, um, well, the Narada came up, and came out, and its captain made visual contact with a Federation starship and identified himself as being Romulan. So there's that. Um, and changing it so Khan is a cat's paw for another villain, and in the process having to be buffoonish, doesn't work. And hurt, and I can't see a way to do that and respect the character and the very good performances of actors who came before. It's not like... It's not like any other actors have played the Mandarin on screen and made a reputation for themselves as an excellent actor because of this. Ricardo Montalban, while he's an excellent actor, probably wouldn't be recognized as strongly as a great actor had he never played Khan or had Khan been something less than what he was. Which is unfortunate because more Hispanic actors need to be receiving him more respect, but anyway. So, I respectfully agree with N.K. Jemsen on her thoughts about how Khan is depict depicted in there and how he should have been done. And so, that done, done talking about the movies, briefly give my thoughts on the book I finished reading, more or less, or got done reading. I'm, I'm done with it. 2312 by Kim Stanley Robinson. This actually book has, book has actually won the Nebula Award 
for best novel. I don't like it. And I had to sit down and think about why, because point where I, was, where I, I put it down for a bit because I had a bunch of homework and midterms and stuff came up, and I went to pick it up again, and I'm like, I don't want to keep reading this. Why don't I want to keep reading this? And I sat, and I thought, and I read a bit further in, and I realized what, it, what, what bugged me about it. And I have to draw some connections to Rendezvous with Rama. With Rendezvous with Rama, I described the book as being something of a travel log, where we see the characters going through one of science fiction's first big dumb objects, the Rama spacecraft, and the driving force of the narrative is the description and the exploration of the well, of the space habitat. And consequently, um, any urgency is related to relates to that travel log. Everything else about Earth is relatively normal, related to what we know. There's been an asteroid impact previously, and it, the damage caused from that in attempt to find and predict future asteroid impacts are the driving force for Rama being discovered when it is, but otherwise it's just um, we found a spaceship, we're going to explore it. And any urgency in the narrative relates to how are we going to get over there to explore more? And then later, when the book, when it turns out that Rama's actually going to leave the system and they, and they don't have as much time to explore the ship as they thought, the urgency then becomes, how can we explore as much as we can in the time that's available? And gather as much information. And consequently, the later portions are actually when we get the most exp exposition on certain areas, because we go from, um, and brief sort of surveying of the area with the idea of we'll come back later. Let's just get the inside mapped to we we can't come back later, get as much data as we can and get out. 2312, on the other hand, it doesn't quite work that way. It has a sort of narrative tone of um, it's got the travelogue thing going on, but it has another major plot thread on there, and the two of them don't mix. And I don't mean like the oil and water mix, because you can make oil... Anyone who's at a salad dressing knows you can make oil and water mix, and good things can come out of it, or oil and another liquid mix. Um, and you can have something good come out of it. Um, and with this... Not a little or oil and vinegar rather salad dressing. I'm, it's a tortured metaphor, but bear with me. Um, you can mix those two liquids and have something good come out of it. You just need some sort of emulsion to make the mesh. And I guess to continue with this weird salad dressing metaphor, um, we have the oil, we have the vinegar, we have no emulsion, or at least the emulsion to make the mesh doesn't quite work. Um, emulsifier to make the mesh doesn't quite work. I'm using the wrong terminology. You foodies, you can complain in the comments. Um, and in the case of Rendezvous with Rama, um, the problem is... Or Rama with uh, 2312. As opposed to Rendezvous with Rama, the problem is... is So our two narrative, our two little threads, the oil and the vinegar, are we have a travel log of the, through the solar system as of the year 2312. Um... We have, at this point, several have colonized and, if not totally terraformed, partially-ish terraformed several planets. All these have colonies on, on several planets, including moods of Jupiter. We've started turning asteroids into what are called terrariums, which are basically orbiting space, habit um, space habitats, which are also used as sort of a means of communication or travel between the other planets. Um... We have, we're in something of a post-scarcity society, sort of. Um, there's other stuff. Are you crashing on me? Okay, that was weird. There's other stuff that's come up. Um, some works better than others in terms of how society works. And consequently, there's a weird societal split between Earth, Mars, and the outer space colony stuff. 
This isn't totally new. This is something that came up with um, last year's Hugo Award nominee, um, The Bithen Awakes by James S. A. Corey, and that, for that matter, kind of in Babylon 5 as well. Uh, there's all these sorts of little things, so and so we're going from planet to planet, exploring them and see what they're like, and there's that part. There's That's, that's the oil, is the overall narrative of traveling and seeing what the universe, or at least our solar system, is like in 2312. Then there's the vinegar, and the vinegar is the, is the plot of a conspiracy, where the main character, um, name is Swan Er Hong, uh, her aunt, or great aunt, or grandmother, or whatever, I think it was aunt, the familiar relationship between the two has gotten kind of blurry later on, um, dies. She gets sick and dies, and her will has her communicate some information to several people, uh, deliver letters, and they have to be delivered personally, and it turns out there's some something going on. There is a conspiracy of some sort going on to the detriment of the space colonies. Or something. Um, I say or something, and I'm vague about this, not because I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but I really can't tell. I'm about halfway through the book, and we just got to the point where we can tell, oh, a conspiracy is there. I don't know, and we have no idea who's doing it, and they've, as far as narrative goes, they've only acted twice, and there's a situation here where we have urgency, but we don't. In the sense that we have in the plot, the conspiracy attacked twice. The conspiracy attacks um, the Mercury colony called Terminator, which is a moving um, basically uh, for lack colony thing on the Martian, on the, on the day-night Terminator on Mars. Um... And before that, they've attacked a terrarium and caused explosive decompression. And... So they have these two attacks that ha- that happened. Once before the narrative started, and once um, over the course of the narrative. And the first one's revisited uh, after the uh, second attack. And I go... Okay, this is, this is important. Something's happening. This means something. But we took our sweet time to get here. And you're taking your sweet time to get from here to, for, here to the next part in the conspiracy. And it got to a, the narrative got to a point where the world building actively got in the way of the plot. That all of this discussion of what the world is like at this point in time, what the universe is like, one time, what, what society, societal structures are like, is conflicting with just telling the story of this conspiracy, what their goals are, what they're trying to do, and how the characters stop them. And what kind of bugs me about this is I've come a couple other stories recently, mainly ones which are part, which were part of larger series. James and Corey's um, first part of the Expanse series, Leviathan Awakes, which I've already reviewed, and The Quantum Thief, Again, something I've already reviewed. Um, where we have these big conspiracies going on, and these societies, which are radically different than what we have now, in certain ways and others, but the world building didn't get in the way of the plot. And the discussion of societal issues didn't get in the way of the plot. Whether it's um, the heist of an idea in... Quantum Thief, or how the structures of life in the outer colonies, um, and how things can get unstable, and how close to the raggedy edge things are, and how they can lead to war and tensions between planets and governments in Leviathan Awakes. Those things, the world building and the plot were very closely combined. You can see how they, how well they were, you see how well they were joined. Um, and everything fit, and everything meshed, and 
nothing got in the way. Everything ran smoothly. It was a, it was a tight narrative and great structure to it. And throughout this, we also had a whole bunch of really well-written, really engaging characters. 2312, they, those two threads didn't mesh. The they didn't dovetail. It's it's like I mean it's 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 like oil and water without like making a salad dressing without yeah. I'm tor I'm gonna I'm gonna stop torturing that analogy. Basically, they didn't mesh. They didn't fit, and they just kind of loosely wobble together. You can tell when oh we're in world building mode now, or oh we're in actual plot mode now. And it made the book hard to follow, and it's kind of hard to stick with. It doesn't help that we also have a situation with the narrative where there are characters who know things about the conspiracy and the, vest and the investigation of the conspiracy who don't disclose the information to the reader, even when they're the prospective character, and, or rather... We fall. We we make that. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson makes these characters, the perspective characters, in situations where they're not going to be thinking about the stuff that are that Swan hasn't been told yet. Um, and it also adds to frustration. Um, it just it was really hard to get into this. Rather, I was able to get this book fairly well from the beginning. But, it was re but towards the end, it was really hard for me to stay in and stay attached to the narrative and what was going on. And I've, basically by the halfway point, I've fallen out. Um, if you listen to the podcast, um, so the, the Sword and Laser podcast for, the, for their book club, you may be familiar with the term lemming. That is when um, you read a book, you kind of fall out of love with it, or fall out of the narrative. It, it knocks you out and you can't get back in and you don't want to continue. It's derived from when, on the sh on the show for one of their picks for monthly books, they picked um, "Memoirs Found in the Bathtub" by Stanislaw Lem, and well, a lot of people didn't like it. In particular, uh, Veronica Belmont, one of the show's hosts, and she couldn't finish it. And since then, "lemming" has been the term for putting down a book partway through and just saying I'm done. And that's what I'm doing with 2312. I'm putting it down, I'm done. So, there are still two other books of particular note for the, well, three other books of particular note for the uh, Hugo Award nominees to read. I have currently been listening to the audiobook of um, one of, Sa of Saladin Ahmed's book, be right back, I'll bring the cover, and I'm not going to worry about it, Throne of the Crescent Moon. Uh, is the name of the book. And it's his first time book. It's also the first time a author of Middle Eastern descent has been nominated for a Hugo Award. Um, it's fantasy, but, you know, some science fiction stuff could pop up, could pop in later. I haven't gotten in far enough yet to say it one way or the other. And thus far, the book has hooked me really well. The characters are interesting. The story is interesting. Um, I'm definitely going to finish it thus far, and I think unless something really drastic happens to make me go, no, no, I'm done. I'm definitely in in it for the long haul on this book. Um, I also still have Red Shirts by John Scalzi to either read or listen to. And there's the book, new book by Lewis McMaster Bajold in the uh, Miles Vorkosikin series, which is nominated, and I need to read that too. I'm not currently current on the Miles Vorkosigan series, so in particular I'll be approaching this book from the perspective of, if you have a little passing knowledge of who Miles Vorkosigan is and the mythos and or the, or the universe and so forth and so on, but you're not like really current and into it, uh, how well does the book hold up? So that, that's the approach I'll be taking it from. And that pretty much covers this video. Um... I'll be doing some Let's Play stuff soon. That's something I can reasonably manage while still doing schoolwork stuff. Um, I'll try to do some more regular videos and get back up to Nintendo Power Retrospectives and that sort of thing. As yet, I haven't gotten any takedown stuff or whatever from uh, 
not the Tig Town, but stuff from Nintendo for trying to flag my videos or anything like that over their Let's Play thing. I should be immune from that, or at least I should be able to protect myself from that, because their review should... Nintendo Power Retrospectives is and always will be reviews. It's not a Let's Play. I'm there to discuss... I'm here to discuss my thoughts on Nintendo Power as a magazine and Nintendo's games and the games for, for Nintendo systems throughout what we consider the retro period, and that's what we'll be focusing on there. So, enough rambling from me, and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.